Hello, everybody. Good morning. I believe all of you are excited for having a nice, wonderful day today. Uh, my name is Satyam. Uh, I've been working at Little Eye Labs. Uh, we build performance analysis tools for uh, uh, Android apps. Okay. Uh, I've been working on uh, this tool since around last one and a half year, and uh, I've been learning about Dalvik. And here I am to just share some of my learnings today with you. Uh, just a small change in the name, it is supposed to be deep dive, but I won't do a deep dive, I'll just do a shallow dive. I don't want to make you uh, uncomfortable, I wanted to make it a little easier. Okay? Uh, this is a quick slide, a small slide about the Android uh, system architecture. If you look at it, these are all various parts of uh, Android. Okay. Um, so uh, you would oops, sorry. You would see that uh, the, I highlighted the Dalvik one. If the Dalvik one is like otherwise, I thought it will be a little difficult to search and find it. So there it is. It's just a small piece on many other things that are there. Uh, however, uh, one thing to just kind of note it is it is the one that which runs your Android apps. So in a way, that is very important. Uh, nevertheless, the others are also very important. Uh, the Dalvik has been kind of designed to in kind of to work with all the other parts as such uh, and taking considerations about uh, the complete Android motivation itself. The Android has been, if you look at it, the complete Android system has been designed uh, taking some of the constraints as follows. You know, one of them is the memory, and right? so it, it has to run with uh, devices which has very low RAM. They didn't want to make use of any swap space too. So it has, they're supposed to work with uh, low memory. And CPU, they're supposed to work at low end CPUs. And more importantly, it should be consuming much lesser battery. So th these are the design constraints that Dalvik has been kind of based in. And we'll try to look at many of those things, how Dalvik has addressed many of these factors uh, while we speak. Uh, uh, if you look at it, how, what does the Dalvik VM really does, right? It is actually just like a JVM. Or in fact, maybe I'll just get in there a little bit. But you write your Java source, uh, your source code in Java, right? So that gets converted into Java bytecode. And that gets converted into Dalvik bytecode. And this Dalvik bytecode is the one that runs on Dalvik VM. The Dalvik VM just runs your Dalvik bytecode. Now, what does the Dalvik? VM does. Yes, it works like the JVM itself. Okay. It, uh, it loads the text files, uh, and it has to interpret all those byte code and execute them on the hardware. And it also might have to do just-in-time compile uh, some of this uh, byte code directly into the hardware code. And apart from this, it also just does some manages your memory too. So before that, uh, so we can actually just look at, start with trying to look at uh, the Dalvik VM when it has to uh, really load the text file. It needs to define a format on how the text file is. So uh, uh, Dalvik has tried to design even the files from the starting from how the file will be structured as and when it's loaded, trying to optimize in terms of memory and all those things. Okay. So if you just look at this figure, right? Uh, so you can see that, uh, like all other files, it has an header, and then it's followed by string IDs. The string IDs are uh, any, any strings that you use in your uh, class source code. Everything will be part of the string IDs. For example, if you use hello world, you use and you are just trying to print a uh, hello world. So that is also uh, hello world is a string. So print and the methods are also strings, and the class names are strings, and all those things. Then that is followed by type IDs. Type IDs, any type references you do, not only those type declarations that you do in your classes, or not, or but all the so all the type references that you do in your classes. Also, uh, information about all those type IDs are there, and then prototype or prototypes. It is the prototypes of all the methods that you use, uh, the method signatures. And the field IDs, fields, uh, method IDs actually have a reference to the proto IDs apart from trying to tell the method type and the method name, etc. And the class definitions and the data. In fact, though all these are there, all of this, this is probably the correct figure in a way. Right? We lose, see that all the references jump from here, here and there, everywhere. Right? So basically, if you look at uh, 
the type ID is type ID will not really store the complete string. It will just tell that hey, uh, this type, the name of the type is this string ID, and the string ID would tell okay, this string whatever is being referenced is actually in data. So everything is actually really speaking in data. The, all the real indexes, everything are there in all the other fields. So, so this is kind of meant to kind of to avoid many of the duplicacies. So if I look at it, no, no, if I go back and try to connect with Java as such, that is being the uh, Dalvik has been trying to follow with Java, trying to connect with Java a little bit. In Java, if you look at it, all the, the jar files that which we generally build uh, consist of many class files. And all the class files exist as it is in the jar file. They are like, they're not kind of compressed. So if you look at it, uh, this, oh, sorry. Uh, Okay, it's a little uh, adder, but if you can see on the left side, all the class files are there. Uh, each class file has the constant pools, and then the uh, red. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, if I look at it, so here is the data, and these are the constant pools for all the classes. And if you look in the dex file, dex file is now kind of all the class files are combined, everything into one particular file as such. Okay, so all the constant pools that uh, are kind of separated separately from all the, are combined from all the class files into one file as such, and all the data has been filed in this. So just with illustrate with a little example. So uh, just let's take a small example, right? So we have an interface, uh, and we have this class uh, plot, and then we have another class zapper. So there are three classes. One of them kind of implements the other one. The other one just uses the other class. And see how it looks like, for example, in a jar file. The jar file, if you see the number of strings that are there, you look at the class uh, zapper, you would see that uh, the strings, the zapper is there, the method signatures are there, and, uh, and if you look at bloat, the similar method signatures are there. And even the strings, again, zapper and zapper are there. So there's a lot of duplicacy of the strings, right? So if you look in the text file, this is how it looks. Well, it doesn't look so clean here, all references jumping here and around. But if you look at it, there's like no duplicacy at all. Right? So the file has been kind of compressed as if that there will be no more duplicacies. All strings point to only one particular string as such. All method IDs, everything will point out to the same thing. Uh, prototypes, if there is a signature which is similar to another method, it will share the same signature. Trying to kind of squeeze on every byte that it can really make it. So uh, that's why the text file is kind of a little compressed. So if you look at it, uh, if I just try to compare the dot text versus the dot jar file, right? So it's a, it is actually just a, uh, in terms of size, it is 50% of uncompressed jar files are printed. That's what I've been reading across. Uh, so though the jar file compressed is lesser, and so in a way the shipping size may be a little different, but at the same time when you load into the memory, it's probably or when you expand your class files and all those things, uh, it'll again blot out. So, so in a way, it uses, the text uses lesser memory. But one thing that you need to really keep in mind is that uh, a jar file, uh, if it's a jar file, your class will be really loaded, or in fact will be found only when you really use it. Right? If you don't use it, it will never be created at all. Uh, in, so, but in the text, it will be actually loaded. It will be there in the memory. Though the class object will not be created, but it will be there in the memory. So, if you kind of avoid really using any unrefer uh, any class files which you think are not necessary, avoid using it. Well, it doesn't save too much memory because the class object is not created and all those things. So, in a way, it doesn't really differ much. But yeah, you may just get some extra bytes free. Okay. Uh, now, uh, but there is an also an advantage of using the text style, which I'll try to touch upon right now. And before that, I just want to explain a little bit uh, in the general, if you go back to the process memory usage, right? If you just go back the way that things used to happen in the uh, Windows or the Unix worlds with your and the native applications there, not in the Java applications. Um, so there, if you look at the shared libraries and the dynamic libraries, so many of the processes use libc or the user dot uh, tll in the Windows side or libc in the window, Unix side. So all applications use it. So now, so the way that they worked out on the operating system is that they try to share the text section of all these libraries on the memory. So basically, if a program A uh, the, and the program 2, both of them load libc, 
the the libc will be mapped into the process in the virtual memory but in the real physical memory it will be there both of them will be sharing the same text size okay so this is one thing that java itself is actually missing you have your class files and if you're running multiple jvms on your machine there is actually not really a good way of sharing those text files so in physical memory they can just be shared right uh, and it will just reduce your ram uses of your ap application or or your compute system as such because there's nothing really different as such so uh, android has kind of tried to solve this problem using uh, this way of dex as well as other things that i'm trying to go ahead so one of them thing is the zygote zygote right so a zygote is a process that they kind of created when it kind of boots up uh, it is actually if you look at it on your uh, android devices there is slash system slash uh, bin slash app process if you look at it uh, it is the one that which really starts the zygote if you just look at help you know to really start the zygote process as such uh, it uh, comes up during the boot process it loads all the framework classes and everything and it just waits for a socket request so that uh, when any other app any other app request comes onto that socket it just forks this application when you fork this application it is easier for the operating system to create that application very fast it just have to just go and mark all the pages that this process has uh, being able to read or write with for the new processes if it is text section they will be only read and for the data sections what it happen is they mark it something called copy on write the copy on write does mean that if you are tra really trying to write into the data pages the other new process then it will actually create a separate page and continue the same will happen for the uh, existing process so in that way the launch of the application will be faster as as at the same time uh, you can actually share the pages also so th this is one main reason that the zycord has gone to just kind of illustrate a little bit about the application launch on on the zycord this is what happens right so uh, when you kind of click your application in the beginning uh, it kind of gets us uh, sorry i think it is little unreadable uh, sorry for that so the uh, you you just click your click your application so it kind of goes to the launcher the launcher takes it calls activity manager that so on site activity needs to be launched and it sees if that is in memory or not if it is in memory it just kind of loads it back or otherwise it sends a message to zygode zygode in turn will create the process return back the pid to this guy and the zygode then will just in invoke the uh, activity thread of the dalek vm to get started with which will internally just load the classes and will uh, get started so this is how uh, zycode will actually really start your application so such now to get back to our other one that which we were talking about the memory part just excuse me one minute as i was saying right so on the java side we are not really sharing the classes here now because the zycode is the one which gets started in the beginning and whenever any app that gets created it just forks the application now you get not only get those pages you also share those text regions you also share those data regions or for example all the text structures that gets created you just share them so though you will be using up some virtual memory of your process as such at the same but at the same time you will not be occupying an extra physical memory on your application on your system in a way so your ram is kind of protected it's okay that uh, your process will take probably more memory if you actually look at mat you don't do anything you just launch the application you bring up mat you'll see a 10 mb or something assigned to your process that's just because it is coming from the zygote it is getting all that memory kind of assigned to your app space okay but so if you just look at it right so i just try i will try to explain to you maybe in the next session uh, next slide uh, so this is kind of the various parts of the memory of, of an application as such so uh, starting with pss so uh, pss you can call is a pro proportional set size of your application as such so uh, th there is some pages kind of share, get shared across various apps and now you have your own apps so the the one that which are kind of shared are called shared and those which are only for you are called private pages uh, and again there is like difference between shared and private the shared has two modes one of them is dirty clean private dirty clean okay 
So the, the dirties are those which, for example, if you get modified or if you throw it out from the memory, we can't restore them back. But if it is the clean, those are the ones which can be restored back. The restored backs are sim simple like these text files, right? Because they are really stored in the files. If they throw their pages from the RAM, you can load them back from the files onto the RAM. And so those are clean. So it's they don't. Uh, so they can be thrown away. So they are uh, lesser in weight. But the dirt, uh, the dirty things should not be thrown away. Otherwise, your app will not be working. Okay. So now, using your apps, uh, the proportional set size is calculated for all your processes such that it uh, looks at all your private files and the shared prices. It will look at how many apps has really been using it and just divide by n. Okay, and so that is the PSS that it kind of attributes to all your processes. So the advantage of these processes, I mean, the PSS is very useful for uh, for the Android, is that it uses this to figure out which service it should kind of actually knock out. Okay, if it thinks that uh, it's running low on memory RAM, it will try to first remove all your cache processes. Then it will actually try to look at all the services or any background apps that are running, which has uh, higher PSS. It will try to first kill them. Uh, it will rank all in various cases, and it will start killing all those processes to be able to make the foreground application or the priority th processes ra do their tasks. So uh, the PSS is the why. The, this is the reason why PSS is very important. Okay. And then comes uh, the shade dirty. The, and if you look at it, then there are two parts, the native and Dalvik. Uh, so just to kind of differentiate, uh, the native is not the native apps that we talk about or the HTML apps. The native is that which uses the process memory as such, the one which is not really the Dalvik. Well, uh, when the Dalvik VM runs, it actually has two kind of heaps. One heap is to run the Dalvik heap is the one which all your applications run in it. So your applications, the Java code, the Java code, that is allocated and everything runs as part of Java heap. And the code that which your shared libraries or any other things that really get created or itself, the memory of Dalvik VM itself, everything is actually goes into the native memory as such. Okay. That's how the native memory and Dalvik memory are kind of separated. And you, uh, so if you just do ADB shell dumps is mem info and just give the PID, you will get all this information. And you can use this information to actually look at um, the memory uh, uh, uses of your application at any point of time. Okay. So just moving to uh, the next uh, talk. So uh, the after text after it loads these files, the one thing it has to do is it has to interpret the bytecode. So to define the bytecode, uh, we, let's see how the bytecode of the Dalvik looks like. I'll just not go deeper enough, but I'll just go quick example. If you look at it, this is the Java code. Uh, this Java code does nothing. It just uh, adds up the, the sum of the given array and just written soups. Actually, I should have written some. Uh, I made a mistake. <laughs> okay. Uh, but otherwise, this is a quick. Uh, this is how the bytecode looks like. Uh, the Dalvik bytecode looks like. Just to kind of uh, touch upon a small, small things here. Uh, here, uh, the Dalvik bytecode uses the register machine, which is kind of a little different from Java bytecode. I'll just touch upon that. And all instructions are like 16 bytes. And if you if you kind of go back to your microprocessor, uh, uh, whatever you learned with x86 and all those places, right? So uh, you would see them. All the instructions are mostly loads, uh, stores, add, and all those kind of instructions. Here, yeah, the bytecode actually doesn't. Well, they have such kind of similar opcodes, but otherwise they have different kind of a little higher level of opcodes too. Yeah, look at, uh, for example, array length, right? So it is array length is one of the bytecode wherein the bytecode actually will map it to figure out that particular uh, variable and kind of tries to run it. Just, just uh, to run through you, uh, maybe uh, here uh, it runs. The, uh, the Dalvik bytecode kind of assumes there are like infinity number of registers, like what the traditional compilers do. They have to they know that how many registers are there and they have to fix it for you, fix it for them. But here it doesn't have to be bound with the runtime. Uh, interpretation will take care about all those things, but otherwise here it will assume there are infinite number of registers and it will just try to uh, allocate them as such. The arguments that are passed are actually the last uh, uh, are the last variables. If you look at it, the v3 here is the oops, sorry uh, v3 here is the one uh, argument that is kind of passed to this method as such and uh, this is how kind of it looks like. We will just touch upon a little bit more later. 
um, and if you can just try to compare with the Java bytecode itself, right? The Java bytecode actually uses the stack machine. The stack machines would not really take any operators. If you go back and look at Dalvik one, all the operators are actually given as an arguments, right? But if you come back here, all the operators are assumed to be on the top of the stack. So some of the operators uh, can be actually those variable names, local variable names, and all those things. But uh, by default, they are assumed to be on the stack and they operate. So, and if you try to compare the number of uh, instructions that are for the same function, okay, it is just as how many instructions? 32, 46, or the number of bytes are uh, 1622, and here I believe it is 23. The, the number of effective uh, byte size is this is little just one more than that but at the same time if you look at it uh, the number of instructions are more and at this, this is simple but that one actually the dalvik actually generates into this bytecode which is almost like how many of our mis machines are or all of machines are actually uh, register based machines so it becomes easier to really translate them uh, if you use a register machine and that's one reason why dalvik has gone with uh, the register machine as such Okay, uh, so to kind of uh, just summarize about the Dalvik bytecode, it uses a register machine, assumes unlimited number of registers, all instructions are 16-bit instructions, well, some of the operators can actually overflow to be, to be the next set, okay, and the registers are assumed to be 32-bit size, and if you need to use 64 bits, it uses both the consecutive registers as such, and n arguments are in the n last registers as such. Okay. Uh, for all the instance methods for uh, the Java classes and all those things which are non-static, right? one of the first argument will be this. Uh, so that will be also be one of those arguments as such. Uh, so moving across. So uh, well, I'm not touching about how to how it really interprets. It can just take that code, find out the relevant code, and just execute that. Okay. So, but now. Let me move towards verification. The one thing that the Java class loader uh, does it when you ro load your class, it actually needs to verify that the class is actually following the proper syntax. Is it like all the uh, string IDs that which we are talking about a few minutes back, right? All of them are in proper range or not? And many other cases, whether the classes uh, defined are actually it, it can just load all its dependencies also, and it also also needs to find out whether um, those classes are valid and it doesn't really crash the stack machine. So similarly, the Dalvik VM also has to do this verification uh, for all these classes. But over the Android as such kind of has a little more control than what a Java can do, the JVM can do, right? So basically it can control your installation. It controls, it knows when you install your app or etc. So when you install your app, uh, it immediately takes the control and it tries to verify right then itself. It tries to verify during just at the installation time itself. And there is this tool uh, that's called TechSoft. It's the one which actually really verifies and also does optimizations also. Okay. Uh, and after it verifies, there is one folder that it calls Android Data, uh, uh, Data Dalvik Cache. It tries to keep all those text files there. Okay. Uh, and to verify, first it loads all the class files in a verif to verify. It actually uh, just uh, looks at your framework jars and etc. to resolve all the classes and verifies that. And if it could not verify any class, if it could not find some class, or if it finds something illegal, it just marks a flag in that particular class file, uh, telling that, no, <coughs> hey, I could not verify this. Uh, this probably is not verified, so that it probably will give an error at a runtime. Because during install time, it should not give a uh, error message to the user as such time. When it is probably when that class file is really used. Okay, and note when this class is used, it's not a complete text. Right? When this class is really used, then it's when it actually will throw an error at a runtime when you are really using that app. It doesn't do during the install time. Okay, uh, okay, so. TechSoft, apart, apart from doing the verification, it also does optimization. So, uh, so that uh, some of the optimizations can happen at the time itself rather than later. So one thing that you can probably ask is why can't I really optimize them uh, during on, the, my, on my system itself? Why do I need to do it during install time? Here, the optimizations that it really does are a little different, which probably cannot be which can be actually platform dependent. So one of them is actually uh, the bytes. So Dalvik uh, assumes all the instructions, everything, all the data are in Little Indian. 
Okay. So many of the processes right now actually really allow both Little Indian as well as Big Indian, but there may be some processes which are strictly Big Indian. So for if Dalvik is kind of put it on those processes, right, they ask to be yeah, swapped. The bytes have to be swapped. So it does those. There is one platform dependent. The other thing it also does is it also tries to inline some functions depending upon the platform. So some of the things it can inline some methods. And it can also optimize some of the methods that it would figure out, which are going into the framework jar and or etc. It can actually directly use the V table to really directly reference into them. Okay, to just go back to the, an example of the inlining, this is a quick example of uh, uh, how we can uh, uh, inline. Right? For example, some of the methods which are very used widely, like string dot length or string dot equals. Right? That this, uh, at the top you see what your normal class file is. It just calls invoke virtual. Invoke virtual is a bytecode to tell, uh, execute this particular function. Okay? Um, here it is trying to tell execute string dot length. And the next line you see is the one, actually if you see in slash data dalvik cache slash data, uh, you, you would find this particular class file uh, which will actually contain the optimized text file. It is actually called odex. And if you look at that, so that one actually has the line execute in line. Okay? So, and it also has some offset which tells this offset is for string dot length. So this probably can be changing, changed across various platforms. So that, that's the reason, so it kind of does an optimizations on the platform itself. So, so one thing that it has to happen, for example, many of you would have got update for uh, Android 4.4, right? So now when Android 4.4 it gets downloaded, all these files, cache files need to be regenerated. So it will take a little while to actually install. So after this it downloads, it has to go back and load all this. It has to keep your original class files, or original text files, and it has to run them again. The text will just run all of those files again and generate once again all these optimized text files flushing the cache. So your original text file also should be left even after you have this uh, new files. So uh, the next thing that uh, uh, the Dalvik VM should be also doing is, should be probably doing just in time compilation to avoid interpretation every time. It was introduced with uh, Android 2.2, actually. Uh, so before that, or even after that also, if you have a very high CPU bound application, it is better that you write your application in C code. Okay, that's because you will avoid those interpretation moving back and forth and all those things. It is, that's what is recommended. But to kind of reduce that usage, okay, it's better to do some kind of a just-in-time compilation. So they have, uh, Android has introduced just-in-time with uh, Android 2.2, and the, the goals that they had for like it has to become effective quickly. If you look on the Java on the server side or on your desktop, and generally your applications there will be running for a time. So it's okay that it actually takes a while to warm up, and then it starts trying to look at the caches, see which one it should really uh, optimize and then continue. But here, the applications that may be running, it has to just get optimized very quickly. So it, it has to start, uh, start really, it cannot wait for warm up, basically. And the memory is a constraint. It should not be using too much memory. And of course, they should not be constantly doing, they should be very careful in how much is really compiled into the uh, native program as such. Okay, so when they decided, when they were trying to look at which JIT they should be using, okay, they came up with the, these are the two traditional JITs that are apparently used much. One of them is the uh, trace method, and the other one is the method JIT. The, in the method JIT is actually much simpler in a way is that you have your um, code, you can, and it will just see the methods which are executed heavily, and it will just do just and compile for those methods. Okay, and if you look at it uh, in, in this. Figure. The first box is showing you uh, the f full program uh, uh, parts. Those yellow pieces are the methods that which are really used. And if you just optimize them, you will you will be using this much memory only. You will be really just in time. So that's what they kind of put it across is like only 10% of the code actually really executes a lot. Okay. And uh, then the next thing is. Uh, you can just, uh, doing a method JIT is very simple. Uh, you just actually have method boundaries. You just need to find out and you 
do just sit for the particular methods. But one of the disadvantages the methods it has is that the complete the flow in the com all the flows in the method are not really executed every time, right? Because uh, there may be some if else ports which will never get executed. So we are unnecessarily sometimes probably just doing JIT code to, uh, for those codes which are never getting executed. So uh, the trace JIT actually takes advantage of that. It will actually ex really just in time compile at a basic block levels or as n number of basic, basic blocks they can just do just on that rather than the complete method. So trying to reduce the uh, instructions that you which we do just in JIT or at the same time uh, we, by just reducing that your cache will be less, your memory requirements will be less and the CPU that you spend cycles on trying to just do just time time compile will also reduce. So and if you look at in this figure it tells that uh, just two percent of the program is actually can be is really generally optimized in this particular case. Okay. Just to have a quick flow about how the trace it works. Uh, when your application is actually running, it actually just updates a profile count for that location as such. When it reaches a threshold, it will actually just look at whether that particular uh, uh, code is actually the translation for that already exists or not. Okay. If it, the translation already, uh, if it just exists, it will just use the translation. If it doesn't exist, it will actually uh, uh, go, uh, the interpreter will actually go and look at each uh, bytecode and see until when it probably can give it to the compiler thread to really execute. So basically trying to see, hey, the code is getting complex, let me stop here, kind of those things. It will just try to figure out that and it will give it to the compiler thread. And if you look at uh, the number of threads that your application is running through DDMS or whatever, right? So you can actually see that uh, there will be one particular thread called compiler which is actually occasionally doing just in time comparison. So when this gives a notice to the compiler thread to go and optimize, it will try to take those pieces and I'll try to uh, compile them and put them in a translation cache. The translation translation cache apparently is very small. They used to have just something like 200k or so. It's so less. Uh, and now once the code is translated, any exit points that are gone, so it, that exit points will be bound back to the interpreter or if that translation for that other basic block also exists, it will be actually bound to that so that it doesn't have to use one more. The small, small optimizations to make most out of the just in time compilation. Okay, but is that enough? Okay, so but still there is a cost to the interpretation. It has to interpret every time. There's a cost. We optimize a little bit, but still there is a limit to that. So with Android 4.4, .4, um, and Android is kind of introduced or try to preview with uh, something called ART, the Android runtime is what they call. So yeah, if you have uh, got an update for 4.4, .4, you can try it out. Uh, in developer options, you can go and tell. Uh, uh, we, we, we can just tell, uh, include a ART, and just uh, it'll probably use those things. I didn't try it out. Okay. Uh, but the way that I understand is that when you install, it'll do compilation at that point of time. It'll compile into almost native code at that time. So effectively, the interpretation, the just-in-time, and all those things may not be necessary if you just do that. Well, so one question that you probably can be asking is that, hey, why can't I generate my executable directly on my desktop itself? Why should it do something here? Right. So, so by just doing it at a at a system level, it can actually take advantage of the CPU that your current system is using. For example, if uh, we uh, at Little Labs actually have a native code as such, and we wanted to use one library which heavily uses on uh, the thumb uh, instructions of ARM, we, ca we could not use it just because the Galaxy Y, uh, the, the ARM chip that comes with Galaxy Y, doesn't support the thumb instructions. So we, and we could not really know. One thing for me to do is that either I support multiple shell libraries are built for all of those, and depending upon the system, I load that, or otherwise don't take advantage of the thumb instructions. So to reduce the pain, currently I not using the thumb instructions. But if the if I just outsource that my job to somebody else, that would be better, right? And I can't keep multiple versions of my shared libraries and all those things. That will be painful for me to maintain. So by now pushing it to the runtime or to the install time, uh, Dalvik is trying to give away, throw away your work from there, and they know because they know the, the they can know which Android processor it is, and they can optimize it better for that particular Android, uh, for that particular ARM chip or whatever chip it is. 
Okay, so th th that is the advantage is that you can actually go when you move towards the Android runtime. Okay. So uh, th that's what happens at the uh, just on time compilation and the runtime. Now the other thing that what uh, Android. Okay, so I think uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just finish. But uh, okay. uh, uh, the me memory is one main part. Uh, that is the other thing that what Android Dalvik really manages. So just to keep cap. So if you actually look at your locket, there are two um, main important things that really part. One of them is the GC concurrent, and one of them is the GC for malloc. Before Android, Android 2.3, they used to do only GC for malloc. Okay, w wherein uh, the, it just stops the complete world. If you memory or not, uh, not. Uh, uh, Regularly, but yeah, regularly it stops the complete all the suspends all the threads and tries to garbage collect the memory. With uh, Android 2.2, they changed a little mode wherein they call it the, uh, this concurrent mode. What with that will, which will just uh, suspend for a few minutes, just do a marking, and then it will do a small sweeping. Then again, it will try to lock, try to make sure that everything is fine, and it will kind of sweep, and then it will free the memory and it will go. So it will. It, it does almost everything, but it tries to stop the rest of the world only less time. However, at the time, if the memory uh, allocation fails at the time, and if the GC for concurrent is happening, the memory uh, allocation will actually stop, and it'll actually you will see in the lock cat wait for uh, waiting for concurrent allocation to finish. Kind of those messages will be seeing those things. So you can just add look at the lock cat to figure out. So if you see at the last uh, uh, last seconds, it is uh, you have the time. Okay. Uh, the pause time is here. Here is a pause time for this one. You have to just have a look at this to figure out how much pause time your application is kind of taking. Okay. So uh, these are some of the references that you can go. I can probably share with you if you have anything. And uh, do you have time for questions? Okay. So any questions? Hi, my name is Garima. Hi. Uh, so I have a question for you. So what is the difference between uh, using a jar file for library and referencing a library, at, I mean, referencing as a library project at the Dalvik level? Uh, OK. Um, I'm trying to understand uh, the hybrid application you're talking about is uh, the so, so if we are including external libraries, right, we okay. can either include a jar file in our project. Hmm. Right? Or we can reference another project as a library project. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do they do so, so all these jar files get converted into Dex as such. Okay, even your hybrid programs will be just running those files in Dex and it will just run them. The Dalvik doesn't know whether it is an hybrid or non-hybrid. It will just knows as Dex code and it will just try to execute them as such. Okay. Hi, this is Sarana. I said. So, uh, my question is uh, more about uh, you know uh, multi-core processors. So okay. How does uh, the Dalvik VM you know takes advantage of the multi-core? Okay. So uh, the the Android OS actually takes care of the multi-core places. The Dalvik just tries, kind of tries to interpret it, and it will just try to see that uh, the number of reads, write collisions, and all those things happen properly, and all those things. But at the same time, uh, it, I, I don't think it does anything special for so it. It doesn't have to worry about it. I think it's the voice which will really take care of it. Thank you. Hi, this is Parkira. Yeah. So my question is, uh, how does it resolve conflicts between different jar files having different versions? Uh, d different jar files have different versions? Like I have two versions of a jar file uh, in the same application, and uh, my application is using the same class. So does it, uh, is it able to resolve uh, conflicts between the same classes? So yes, uh, really speaking, the text will assume that there is only one class for there is only one class for a particular complete server name. It doesn't really allow two things to happen. So when you compile it, it will figure out in the class path which one comes first, and it will include only that particular class file in the text file. It doesn't include all the classes. Uh, There's a counter question here. So uh, supposing I'm using a library, and that library is using a jar file, and uh, 
the same graphon I am using in my application. So basically, uh, and the, both the versions are different, then how does it resolve it? So, uh, yeah, it will just figure out which, which one is in the first in the class path that it can find. Right? If there are two particular ones, it will just figure out the first one. It will not. When you build, this happens during the build time itself, right? It's not at the run time. Okay? But when the DX, which builds your, all your jar files and combines into a text file, that time itself, it will actually look at, the uh, it will figure out the class file which it really thinks is proper and or which it finds first on the class path, we will try to use that. So I, I think it, uh, yeah, in some cases it will find multiple text errors when they are similar names. I think maybe sometimes it use those warnings. Sometimes it can just choose not to use everything else and try to figure out. Hi, this is Ajay. Uh, with the introduction of ART, uh, there is no interpreted code anymore, right? Mm -hmm. It's all ahead of time combined. Yes. So, it's a, it's a sunset for Dalvik or it's like Dalvik? So, so I'll put this way, right? So, the Dalvik is doing uh, kind of around three things, right? It's also doing the memory, memory management for you, right? So, the memory management, somebody should just be doing that. So, so such com kind of components will still be their part of uh, the head of comp compilation. I'm sorry, it will be there, still be their part of the ART as such. The memory garbage collection and everything will be there. So you can assume that the interpretation piece or the just-in-time compilation piece, yes, both of them probably may not be there, but there will be some other pieces that which would probably still be there in the so in, in, in the runtime library, which will be there. So can we say that ART is going to be a part of the Dalvik VM? Wh which uh, so uh, I, I won't talk. ART will be part of the Dalvik VM. I think both of them will be probably be separate. Okay, it will be, but still the, the various other pieces that what we discussed today, right, the text files and all those things will still continue, as, but at the same time, uh, the interpretation and the just-in-time compilation will probably not be there. Hi. And, and it is still in preview, so I, I think they are just kind of testing to make sure that everything is fine, but yeah, maybe the next version will probably, they'll probably make that one preference to the time. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, with the introduction of ART, uh, what implications does it have for uh, garbage collection? Can we expect the pauses to be more deterministic or maybe take less time? Uh, I'm, uh, I, I don't think there should be much difference in either way. I think it should be the same. I'm not expecting it to be different. Guys, just a couple of questions. That's it. We are done. I land, see, uh, so I'm Sharma, uh, yeah. I'm from Hyderabad, uh, I land uh, to the question what Mr. Uh, this person okay. has asked about ART. Uh, so uh, my understanding is ART is uh, a big advantage in Android, but uh, uh, according to the discussion what, uh, for that question, ART is just a complement to David. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, is it just a complement where it works in sync with uh, Dalvik or does it, does ART has really a uh, huge advantage in uh, real-time so, scenario? Yeah, it, it has an advantage, right? It will try to, now no longer interpretation will be necessary, so your applications probably will be faster a little bit. That's fine, but... Uh, but your installation time will be slower, but th I think that's okay for people. Yeah, uh, then in that case, uh, will uh, Zygote Initiate the, the Zygote will still continue, right? So one of the issues that would be they need they can just share this all this code and everything. So it may just note the class files, but it will be there so that your launch time will be faster. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, will Zygote uh, call Dalvik or will uh, Zygote will let ART? So, uh, Zygote will be using ART. Thanks. How will the uh, like the Dalvik take ex advantage of the processor on which it is, it is running? Because every processor has some special instructions, like maybe SIMD or maybe doing fast multiplication and all those stuff. So how does Dalvik handle this? So, so the Dalvik is you can actually the Dalvik and every time you know your Android machine, you build Dalvik depending upon the processor architecture. Right, so it knows about how the process architecture is. So it knows if it has to take advantage of the SIMD architectures or etc. Depending upon the processor, there it will take advantage of them. So the will be different for different 
So, so the code is almost similar, except there will be some if depths or whatever necessary. But at the same time, yes, if there is be, there is an if the processor has simply, it will take advantage of that. Kind of it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Karan. Uh, with ART, uh, you know, with ART, you can actually read the .oat files as opposed to the previous .odex files. And uh, I heard, I've heard that Android also includes a OAT to ODEX converter. So, like, do you think how, like, uh, using this, uh, how will backward compatibility with previous apps be, you know, that can be managed? So, I, I think it should be backward compatible. I don't think there should be any uh, issues with uh, LibRT being non non backward compatible. If you look at it, so the so really speaking, Dalvik VM, what it does is it really executes the text code, right? The text code, if you look at the text byte code, I don't think it has changed a lot in the last few years. It can just run the old code also, right? So ART should be able to run the new world code also, and I don't think there should be an issue. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so uh, there's a, uh, you, 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 at 12.30, there's a speaker console there. Like, I will be there in that room. If you just take out and you take left, I'll be there in that room. If you have any further questions, uh, you can meet me there. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a nice conference.